So, Professor Mondich, it's a big day uh, in really kind of the history of science, right? Tell us where you are today. So I uh, was at the Washington DC today um, in the uh, National Press Club uh, where um, my collaboration, the LIGO Scientific Collaboration has uh, announced uh, together with the National Science Foundation that uh, for the first time uh, we have detected directly gravitational waves coming from a merger of two black holes. So let's talk, let's talk about, uh, first of all, what are gravitational waves, just kind of in the most basic sense, and why are they important? So gravitational waves were uh, first uh, predicted by Einstein exactly 100 years ago, uh, and they come out from his uh, theory of general relativity. Um, however, they're predicted uh, to be also very, very small, and that has to do with intri intrinsic weakness of the uh, gravitational force. So what, uh, what did we use? What piece of equipment or pieces of equipment did we use to detect all this? So LIGO has uh, uh, built two detectors, uh, one in Hanford, Washington State, and the other in uh, Livingston, Louisiana. And each of them is an interferometer, uh, which is an optical device. Uh, however, in our case, um, uh, the, uh, each of these interferometers has an L shape where uh, the two arms of the L uh, are four kilometers or about two and a half miles long. And there is a laser beam uh, traveling through, uh, through the, um, each of the arms and bouncing back. And basically it's the, uh, uh, the fluctuations in the power of these two lasers when they come back that tells us if a gravitational wave is passing through or not. Effectively, a gravitational wave uh, would stretch and shrink space-time as it passes through, uh, thereby shrinking and stretching the two arms of the, of the interferometer, and that's what we can detect. So you essentially, let me make sure I have this right, have two different um, measuring points that are a certain distance apart from each other, and as the gravitational wave passes past both of those points, it affects one slightly differently than the other, and the difference in how those two readings come out tells you that something happened, right? Exactly. Um, the, the difference in time, so in this particular case, the Livingston uh, detector in Louisiana uh, detected the uh, waves first, and, and seven milliseconds later, the wave reached Hanford. Uh, that time difference uh, allows us to tell where on the sky uh, this event happened, and it turns out in this particular case, it was the uh, in the southern sky towards the Magellanic Cloud. So I think of these two black holes almost as um, I don't know dance partners, sort of dosy doing around each other, and then they they get closer and closer together, merge as one, and as that happens, as you said, all of this energy is released. So um, I know that some of the articles I was reading said that a, a, a mass, a gigantic mass, vaporized. And we know from some basic physics that there's law of conservation of, of energy. So that mass went away, and that mass got turned into these gravitational waves. Is that right? That's, that's correct. Uh, in fact, that's the Einstein's famous equation, E equals mc squared, that tells us how, how much mass corresponds to how much energy. OK. Um, I have some questions about the, the waves themselves. Do they behave like? waves in a pool would, where if you drop a, a pebble or something into a pool, they get progressively weaker as they radiate, radiate out from kind of the epicenter? Yeah, that's a, that's a, a very good, uh, uh, I think, intuition or intuitive picture. Um, like any waves, uh, the uh, gravitational waves do get weaker with, uh, with, uh, 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 as they travel further away from the source. Um, in this particular case, what, they, the, what, the, what actually is waving is space-time itself. Um, if, uh, if, as the wave is propagating, the dimensions of space that are perpendicular to the direction of propagation get shrunk or stretched uh, uh, in an alternating manner. And it's, uh, uh, it's a very specific prediction of general relativity, which uh, the LIGO detectors were specifically designed to, to detect. And because, well, so do we know when in time this black hole merger occurred? Is it, is it like, uh, you know, when we see supernova explode and it takes thousands of light years for that, that light to get to us? Is it the same kind of thing here? It's similar, except that in this case, the event happened 1.3 billion years ago. Wow. Uh, or to put it in different words, it's, uh, it, 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 the event happened 1.3 billion light years uh, away from us. So very, very far away. So now that energy radiating out over all that time and all that distance managed to, to create 
was it a phase difference in the wavelength of the laser light in the LIGO? Is that how you determined the, the movement? That's exactly right. Uh, as I mentioned, in, in the L shape uh, uh, of the interferometer, there are two beams. Uh, when they leave the, the, the corner of the, of the L, they're in phase. And if there is no gravitational wave, they would come back in phase as well. Um, but uh, if a gravitational wave passes through, one arm will be stretched a little bit, the other one will be shortened a little bit. And uh, as a result, the two waves, when they come back, will not be exactly in phase anymore. They will not be, uh, 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 they will ha have shifted a little bit with respect to each other. How can you notice such a small shift in phase with this detector? That's a, that's a very good question. Um, and the way to think about this is uh, that uh, when the measurement is done, uh, 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 the, the measurement is done by every single photon inside of the interferometer. So the more photons you have, the more measurements you have, and you can effectively do a, a lot of averaging. How is it possible that somebody walking by with a magnet or a truck or something big and metal doesn't interfere with the gravitational field or the sensors in any way? How do you know that this happened from this black hole merger? That's, uh, uh, of course, uh, a very important question, and it's actually something that we spend a lot of our time on. Um, in particular, each uh, of our two detectors uh, or two sites is also equipped with many um, environment monitors. So, for example, we have a lot of seismometers, accelerometers, microphones, and so on, and we measure the motion of the ground, we measure the uh, uh, fluctuations in the magnetic field, uh, we measure uh, acoustic disturbances, and so on. So um, if we observe something in our gravitational wave channels, the first thing we do is we check did something happen in, the, in, in, in our experimental hole? What, did somebody make some loud thud? Or, um, and then if, if we pass that uh, 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 test, then we check, well, did the other detector see the same thing? And if it did, and chances are most of the disturbances are you know, local um, and uh, are not correlated between uh, detectors that are basically at two, end, uh, two different ends of the country. Uh, then in that case, you, you build up your, your confidence. Now you're looking at something uh, that could be real. And then the rest of the study is uh, trying to understand, to extract what you can learn about this event from the actual waveforms. In this particular case, that was the masses of the black holes, the distance, and so on. Does this get us any closer to time travel? That's what a lot of people have been asking me on Twitter and Facebook. Yeah, unfortunately, I think the answer to that is no. Uh, the, the, main, uh, the, main, uh, uh, the main thing that comes, that's coming out of this discovery is a deeper understanding of, of the fundamental uh, um, uh, laws of nature, if you like. Uh, we're, we're getting closer to really understanding how the universe works um, and uh, uh, what exactly that will mean you know, 100 or 200 years of, uh, from now, it's hard to tell. Uh, one good example, uh, that I always uh, uh, bring up is when Albert Einstein put together the general theory of relativity, he didn't have GPS in mind, but here we are 100 years later and we can't live without it. Um, uh, so the practical applications, I'm sure, will come, but it will take time to, to have them developed. Is there a way to quantify um, or relate this to previous scientific findings or kind of aha moments? Where does this kind of rank in the pantheon of, of, of scientific eureka moments? Well, I'm sure the answer to that will depend on the person you ask. Uh, personally, I think this is, this is among the highest achievements uh, uh, of science ever. Uh, I think it, it, uh, 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 in the more, most recent history, I think it ranks very, very highly close to the uh, right up there with the discovery of the Higgs boson a couple of years ago. Um, but I'm sure that the others will uh, may have different opinions on this. Well, one thing is true, and that is you've helped us understand something that uh, is clearly very important. Hopefully our, our viewers got a chance to kind of maybe um, get some of the questions that they had answered. I want to thank everybody on Facebook and Twitter for submitting some of those questions I asked you. And I want to thank you, Dr. Mandich, uh, for your time. Congratulations. Thank you, and thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to speak about this.